This episode of Trifles is brought to you by the Baker Street Journal, the leading publication of Sherlockian scholarship since 1946. Find them online at bakerstreetirregulars.com. Welcome to Trifles, a weekly podcast about the Sherlock Holmes stories. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Yes, the colorman was retired, the three-quarter was missing, and the client was illustrious, but there are so many other details to pick apart in the stories. Pray, be precise as to details. You know the plots, but what about the minutia? Have you ever wondered why Sherlock Holmes had three different colored dressing gowns? Or what a Crockford is? You are very inquisitive, Mr. Holmes. It is my business to know what other people don't know. Scott Monty and Bert Wolder will have the answers to these questions and more in Trifles. The game's afoot. Episode 218, Buffets. Hello, 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 and welcome once again to Trifles, the Sherlock Holmes podcast where we get into the details of the Sherlock Holmes stories. I'm Scott Monty. I'm Bert Wolder. And Bert, boy, I'm stuffed. I couldn't eat another bite. <laughs> well, you know, you're having too many between meal snacks. I find <laughs> that, you know, a simple roast turkey is my average lunch. It really keeps me full and warm and ready for high tea at four o'clock. I like that. I like that. Well, you know, it's, it's only a 12 or 13 course meal. So what can we do? <laughs> Well, you are listening to Trifles, and this discussion will be anything but trifling today. The show notes for this episode are available at ihose.co slash trifles218. That will bring you to sherlockholmespodcast.com to the specific episode in question where you will have the availability of links and images and anything else we decide to put up and the ability to support us for as little as $1 a month to show your care for what we do here. It helps with the research. It helps with the, um, you know, the, the extreme, uh, cost of having a daily luncheon buffet for Bert and myself. And, um, you know, it keeps the lights on here. So, uh, thank you very much in advance for supporting the show. And we should mention that because today's program is about buffets, one of our links includes sausage links. And we urge you to click on those links pretty quickly because those sausages have been near the bright lights a little too long. Now, I was hoping that we would get the patties in here this time around, but I guess not. <laughs> All right. Well, we are talking about buffets. Now, you might ask yourself, Scott, Bert, what on earth do buffets have to do with the Sherlock Holmes stories? You know, we've talked about some of the food you might find on the sideboard before. We've talked about the, uh, the, the, the suppers that have been prepared, the snacks, etc. cetera. Um, but we didn't speak specifically about buffets. Now, Bert, why, why would a buffet, which seems like a, a consummate 20th century and early 21st century invention, crop up in the Sherlock Holmes stories? Well, there are two reasons. One is that it's a typographical error from someone who is trying to spell beret. But uh, the real answer and, you know, I would have said, if someone would have asked me, how many times, you there, you, you Sherlockian guy, how many times do you think the word buffet appears in the Sherlock Holmes stories? I would have muttered a confident zero. But no, no, it's not true. There are two appearances. And it's really interesting because, you know, it's another one of these things. It's like turning over a rock. You know, you find, and I would have once said, you know, I've been proven wrong, obviously, on this in the past as in many things, that the word flamingo was never in the Sherlock Holmes stories. But no, no, there it is. In any case, 
it's one of these things like, you know, you lift up a rock and there's sort of a whole little world here. And buffet appears twice, both in terms of a destination. While Holmes and Watson are engaged in railway journeys, that they are moving towards and uh, in the hopes of getting a quick, quick refreshment, a quick repast. Well, that's fascinating. And, and interestingly enough, we'll, and we'll talk about the, uh, the context of both of them, but they both appeared in stories that were published in 1893. Um, I, I can't recall off the top of my head, and we'll, we'll explore this as we look at the history of buffets, whether anything specific happened in 1893 to bring buffets to the attention of Dr. Watson or to Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Well, he was then Arthur Conan Doyle, not the Sir yet. Um, what, was there a buffet on the mind for some reason that made that made them think about the necessity of buffets in 1893. So, please. Oh, but that's a really interesting observation. I hadn't thought about that at all because, in fact, it is just a – it really is, folks, a trifle. You know, the fact is that our heroes are on their way to this place or that place and time may be running short, food may be on their mind. But the, it doesn't add anything to the case or the detection. It's not as if it's there because Holmes makes an observation about, uh, you know, this, that, and the other thing. He's not talking about the parsley sinking in the butter in the buffet. <laughs> so, yeah, it's a great question. Now, why is it there in two cases from 1893? That's yeah. really interesting. So so let's look at each of these, if we can. Um, and, and the reason that this came up as a topic for trifles is I was rereading uh, the final problem as we were thinking about Professor Moriarty in a few recent episodes. And there was a, uh, a paragraph where Holmes and Watson had stepped off the train and, you know, watched Moriarty go by in the special that he had engaged. I said, far away from the Kentish woods, there rose a thin spray of smoke. A minute later, the carriage and engine could be seen flying along the open curve, which leads to the station. We had hardly time to take our place behind a pile of luggage. When it passed with a rattle and a roar, beating a blast of hot air into our faces. There he goes, said Holmes, as we watched the carriage swing and rock over the point. There are limits, you see, to our friend's intelligence. It would have been a coup de maître had he deduced what I would deduce and acted accordingly. And what would he have, and, and, and what would he have done had he overtaken us? Ha! Huh, there cannot be the least doubt that he would have made a murderous attack upon me. It is, however, a game at which two may play. The question now is whether we should take our premature lunch here or run our chance of starving before we reach the buffet at New Haven. <laughs> now that's, that's interesting because it's Holmes thinking with his stomach in this case rather than Watson. You know, we're so used to Watson kind of leading with uh, w with uh, thinking about where the next meal is coming from and, you know, the Granada series, tongue-in-cheek, kind of having Holmes defer to Watson's need to eat. Um, but in this case, it was Holmes thinking about, well, we sh should we take lunch here or should we wait for the buffet at New Haven? Mm. But what what on earth would a buffet at New Haven actually bring them? Well, it turns out apparently quite a lot. And, you know, one of the things I didn't realize is that there were apparent, it, it, I'd say two things about this. One is that even though we've done some research, I've not been able to get a very clear picture of precisely what would have been available. It would be great if you could look online and maybe somebody can find it online and find a menu from a 19th century English railroad stations buffet to see exactly what was served there. I mean, you can make some deductions. I mean, clearly teas and buns and things and probably sandwiches and soups 
uh, were there. Uh, and there is actually very interesting history up through World War I about railroad station buffets. But, um, you know, it's not that you can um, get a really clear picture of what would have been on offer. So you have to make some conclusions there. But but the one thing I would point out is is where we're going. You know, this conversation you just mentioned took place in Victoria Station. And what's happened is um, Watson has followed Holmes' instructions, very elaborate, very carefully planned, to shake off any pursuers in time, precisely in time, to get to Victoria Station to board this particular car and this particular train. And that's all worked very well. But there they are. This, uh, this in, actually, I should say, this is in Canterbury, not in Victoria Station. They had already taken off from Victoria Station and then alighted at Canterbury. Oh, that's right. That's right. For, so they could observe the special behind them. Yeah, yeah. So they're in Canterbury. But Canterbury is not, they haven't gone a tremendous distance. And the point I was going to make is that there's a, consider where they're going is the continent. And New Haven is pretty much the last railway station in the very southernmost part of England. It's it's a little west of Eastbourne. And it's, you know, it's a substantial um, distance. So if, if today you were driving from London to New Haven, you know, this is about an hour and a half uh, journey. So it's not, you know, a 20-minute um, ride by any means. And there are a number of stops along the way. Um where they were at Canterbury, you know, I'd have to look at a map and see that. Um, so the observation that this is going to take some time, um, you know, and we should think about um, a station buffet at New Haven, um, you know, is a uh, is a real. Uh, I mean, it's a substan. It's a it's a substan. I mean, it's a reasonable thing for Holmes to be saying. Sure. Sure. And, and you can imagine a station like, uh, New Haven being a, um, a, a point of departure for the continental boat, um, would have had all kinds of facilities available to passengers, travelers, visitors alike, uh, to accommodate their needs. Uh, there's a wonderful, uh, image that you found. We'll have a link to it. We can't share the image ourselves since it's under license for some reason. Um, but there's a cartoon depicting a station buffet. And the caption says, uh, trains at the time, this is from the 19th century, no specific date. The trains at the time had no refreshments on board and no toilets. So when the train stopped, there was a stampede to use the station facilities. And in this case, in the doorway, a porter is ringing a bell to warn everyone that the train is about to leave. And you see all these people crowded around uh, tables and standing in line and rushing, you know, pulling their children with them. And interestingly enough, it's illustrated by Richard Dickey Doyle. Huh. Yeah. How do you like that? Yeah, pretty good. Now, you know, just, just looking at the map, um, what's happened, as you pointed out, is they've gone from London to Canterbury, which is in itself a substantial journey. So that's say an hour, an hour and a half, hour, 20 minutes. But now they're farther away rather than closer to New Haven because Canterbury is the easternmost tip, near the easternmost tip of, um, England. So they're sort of north of Folkestone anyway. So now they've got a longer journey by train to get to um, New Haven. And I have never, you know, this is the, it was years ago that I read David Hammer's and Michael Harrison's and others books about the actual journeys and how long these things would have taken. So um, I had not uh, reacquainted myself with that. So the idea of getting some food there at Canterbury, since they've already been traveling for a while, is a good idea. And certainly avoiding the crowds that would uh, necessarily be at New Haven, something that uh, Holmes certainly would have uh, found more appealing. So, well, let's take the chance to reacquaint ourselves with this sponsor. You know, it's all well and good to have a subscription to the Baker Street Journal. In fact, the most recent issue 
just recently came out and is making its way to mailboxes all over the world. But when you're looking for scholarship past rather than present, the easiest way to go about finding that is with the EBSJ. The EBSJ is a PDF archive that provides a complete set of the Baker Street Journal from its inception in 1946 all the way through 2011 on a single DVD in PDF format. That's 276 issues with more than 18,000 pages spanning the old series, the Christmas annuals, and the new series all the way through 2011. Will there be another EBSJ to update us in the last decade? Well, we certainly hope so. What format will it take? Well, that's up to you to find out. But get the EBSJ version 2 on DVD while it's still around. Find it online at BakerStreetIrregulars.com. Okay, we are back. Talking about buffets and stations and what Victorian buffets were all about. So we established ourselves in the final problem uh, as having been in Canterbury, Holmes and Watson, debating whether they would go to um, another location and try their chance at the buffet or whether they would eat lunch where they were. Uh, the other instance of buffet lines or buffets was in... Gosh, I think it was in the Naval Treaty, if I am not mistaken. You are not mistaken. No, that's exactly right. What's the context it's, there? It's another case where they've been someplace and they're getting back from someplace. So so what they've done is they've become engaged in the mysterious events of the Naval Treaty, and they've gone to visit poor old Percy Tadpole Phelps. And they're, they've concluded... Uh, their discussions and their original collection of evidence and observing all the details, gathering all the facts. And um, Holmes and Watson are um, heading back. And we know from the fact uh, that we know the route they followed to leave London to get there. They left from Waterloo. So although they don't specifically say that they are returning back to Waterloo, uh, Watson does tell us it was 20 past three when we reached our terminus. And after a hasty luncheon at the buffet, we pushed on once to Scotland Yard. So we know they're back in London, and it's a pretty good guess they're back in Waterloo. And the interesting thing is that, again, while you can't really find any, or we haven't been able to find any information about exactly what was going on at the railroad buffet and so on, uh, it turns out that the Waterloo buffet also occupied a great place in uh, the history of England around World War One, because in 1915, to 1920, there was a free buffet at the Waterloo Station for soldiers and sailors. And they served, we know this because there's a plaque there today. They fed over 8 million men from British Imperial and Allied forces, completely free, worked and supported entirely by voluntary effort. And in fact, there is a um, an etching or drawing that I saw of Queen Alexandra serving uh, serviceman from behind the counter at the Waterloo Station buffet. Hmm. And it was, uh, and there are many stories if you, if you look and do a little reading of servicemen who, you know, came, tired and weary traveling back up to the counter looking for a sandwich or a bun and inquiring how much, how much is it? Hmm. And being told that it was completely free and then saying, Oh, well, can I have a piece of cake too? <laughs> and uh, they got it. So. Wow, that is something. Well, you know, it's interesting because, uh, you know, we think of uh, the buffet as a, um, a uniquely or at least an inspired American tradition. And yet, um, it really does have its origins in, in Europe. And it really goes back, oh gosh, all the way back to the 17th century, but really gained its popularity in the 19th, uh, from our friends at Wikipedia. Um, they say the 19th century saw uh, suppers, which were lighter meals, some hours after the main dinner. And at some point, they were served as a buffet, and sometimes late at night and at grand balls, where not everyone would want to eat, or not everyone would want to eat at the same time, or in the same quantity. 
and uh, in in a very large building at a large ball, there might not be enough space to seat all of the guests that have been invited. So people would end up uh, eating standing. And um, at at some point, a large cooked English breakfast with various choices was also served this way. So even when servants were on hand, uh, there would be an opportunity for self-service uh, for certain meals. And the the actual word buffet came from the French sideboard furniture where the food was typically placed. A great tradition. Indeed. Indeed. When, when you come to America, the, the buffet actually gained its popularity. No surprise in Las Vegas where, well, at least until the pandemic, it still lived on in great quantity. And yeah. then undoubtedly – Migrated, evolved, transformed, transmogrified into the salad bar. <laughs> you know, and then was never seen again. <laughs> it's funny. I see, so, uh, you know, I've been to Vegas many times uh, for speaking opportunities, for client work, et cetera. Um, it's not one of my favorite places to visit. And, and the buffets out there, I mean, you can get pretty much anything. And to see some of the travelers and visitors, to Vegas, uh, take on the buffet where it's all you can eat. It seems to me that they take it on by saying challenge accepted. <laughs> and you know, it, our, our local community here, we, we go to a few, you know, uh, uh, you know, pancake breakfasts, things like that. And they carefully word it all you care to eat rather than all you can eat. So it Not seems like challenge. it's it's less than a challenge. Yes. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Well, if I was going to a buffet in Las Vegas, I would expect whoever was behind the counter to say to me, I'll bet you're not going to like it. <laughs> Even if we're offering trifles. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Please join us again next week for another installment of Trifles. Show notes are available on SherlockHolmesPodcast.com. Please subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and be sure to check out our longer show, I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, where we interview notable Sherlockians and share news of the Sherlockian world. You take my breath away, Mr. Holmes. I'm just calling to invite yourself... To my outdoors, indoors luxury barbecue with finger buffet. <laughs>